Every three minutes, a family hears the words of every parent's worst nightmare. Your child has cancer. On March 24th, 2020, just 10 days after the COVID emergency closures, we were one of those families. Our amazing eight-year-old son, Colby, was diagnosed with cancer. I took this photo about an hour before the phone call came in with the completely unexpected diagnosis. Our kids were enjoying a spring snowstorm, adjusting to quarantine life, happy, seemingly healthy. 24 hours later, we sat in a hospital room while Colby recovered from surgery to have a chemo port placed, a lumbar puncture, a bone marrow biopsy, and his first dose of chemotherapy. It's impossible to prepare for a moment like that. And in the blink of an eye, our perfect little world came crumbling down around us. A lot transpired in the 24 hours between these two photos. We heard some good news. Colby had a cancer of the immune system called lymphoma, and the prognosis was positive, over a 90% cure rate. And we heard some bad news. It was going to take over two years of hell to get him there. We needed to immediately start up to nine months of intensive treatment with at least 10 different chemotherapies, followed by 18 months on a maintenance protocol. And then it would be five years of follow-up before Colby would be considered cured. He would be 15 years old by then. Then we had to listen to all the potential toxicities that might ravage his body in the coming days, weeks, months, and years. Because the following morning, we would be expected to sign this consent form. And in doing so, we needed to acknowledge and accept the risk. We were one of the lucky families that was able to check the box cure. Some families can only strive to control the disease, or worse yet, palliative care. I have spent the better part of my career as a board certified toxicologist working in the pharmaceutical industry to ensure the safety of new medicines. Can you imagine the irony of the last two years where it feels like we've been living in our very own poorly designed toxicology study with our eight-year-old son as the sole test subject. So today I'm not going to share with you the things you already know about childhood cancer, the nausea, the fatigue, the hair loss, the family members and siblings turned to full-time caregivers. But rather, I want to share with you what it takes to survive the cure. This is just a snapshot of the last 733 days of Colby's life. He has swallowed over 4,000 pills. He has had his chemo port accessed over 60 times. He has had 17 lumbar punctures and countless other procedures, transfusions, ER visits. We're very lucky to have good insurance because the cost of his care is now nearing $1 million. Just prior to Colby's diagnosis, he earned his first degree black belt. Six weeks into therapy, he was barely recognizable in both appearance and personality as a result of treatment with steroids. This, this was just the beginning. Colby was then administered a drug called asparaginase, where he was one of the unlucky up to 45% of kids who develop a life-threatening reaction. His team had to stop dosing, and days later decided to proceed with a backup drug, despite the fact that they could only secure half the needed dose. Can you imagine your child needs an FDA-approved medication and finding out it's not actually available. It was unfathomable to us. But in the end, 
it didn't matter because Colby had a second, more severe reaction to the backup drug, requiring a second, more intensive rescue as his airways started to close. In the days that followed, he struggled with horrible nightmares where he dreamt he had stopped breathing again, but this time, no one knew how to save him. Next up was a drug called cytarabine, and Colby developed a persistent fever of 106 degrees Fahrenheit. He had a rash that started on his head and slowly traveled down to his toes. During this time period, his immune system was completely abolished, rendering his body essentially defenseless to infection, and he required several blood transfusions. Ultimately, his team decided that the rash, the fever, was likely toxicity from the chemo. But it was a critical part of this protocol. So they continued to dose, and he got progressively worse, until finally, the dosing ended, the fever started to resolve, the rash started to fade, and his skin peeled off his body. Just weeks later, Colby yet again started to develop incredibly high fevers following infusions of methotrexate. Now, fevers are so common in kids on chemo. As a parent, you fear the thermometer rising because it means, at minimum, a trip to the emergency room and a dose of IV antibiotics. Unfortunately, this episode was so much more than just another fever. Colby's body was struggling to metabolize the chemotherapy, resulting in exaggerated toxicity. He had sores in his mouth that rapidly amplified down his esophagus, a painful sunburn-like rash, and a thrush infection. It was at this point, despite the fact that Colby had several more doses remaining on this part of the protocol, his team decided they would stop. His eight-year-old little body was begging them to stop. This was Colby at the end of that episode and nine months of hell. A skeleton of his former self, weak, terrified, and ravaged by chemo. As parents, there was this huge sense of relief for the worst of this torture to finally end, but a pit in our stomachs about what so many misdoses might mean for his potential to relapse. So where is he now? Two years post-diagnosis, 733 days later, Colby continues to take chemo every day. He now wears leg braces due to the toxicity he's experienced from vincristine, which is a mainstay on many pediatric oncology protocols, but is associated with a well-documented and relatively common neuropathy and muscle tightness and weakness in the extremities. Vincristine has dramatically limited Colby's ability to walk and run. So you may be asking, how does he do it? How does he keep moving forward? Well, I will let him tell you. People often ask me how I stay so positive. And I always say that I really don't think of myself as a kid with cancer. I just think of myself as me, Colby. As hard as this has been, I think cancer has really changed me because it not only make, made me think about myself, but it also made me think about others. Colby started his own toy drive through which he's now delivered nearly 3,000 toys to kids fighting cancer. And he's used his voice to advocate for the Pablo Foundation and their Shutterbugs program. The Pablo Foundation was founded in memory of Pablo who bravely battled childhood cancer but died six days after his sixth birthday. The Pablo Shutterbugs program teaches kids living with cancer to express themselves through the art of photography. This is a photo 
that Colby took during a Shutterbug's course. And this is how he describes it. Resilience. This tree is like me because it looks like it's been through some tough times, but it's growing from them just like me. Days after Colby's diagnosis, we started a Facebook group, primarily as a means of keeping our family and friends up to speed on his progress. But it quickly became so much more than that. It was like we just walked through some invisible door to this world of pediatric oncology that we never knew existed before. We learned that we were on the easy road. Colby is on one of the least intensive protocols. His cancer is considered low risk. We caught it early. He's not suffered through multiple rounds of radiation and surgery, long inpatient stays, a bone marrow transplant. The truth is, there are thousands of these kids out there. Their families openly sharing on social media. You see incredible suffering. You see awe-inspiring resiliency. In the end, these kids, they're just kids. They're no different than your kids, your grandkids, your nieces, your nephews. And you see parents, parents with an amazing ability to self-assemble and advocate not just for their own child, but for the nearly 400,000 kids that'll be diagnosed just this year. They form foundations. They beg pharmaceutical companies to invest in more innovative therapies. And they rally for grassroots funding to support the desperate need for basic research. Much like CNN reporter Andrew Kaczynski, who lost his beautiful daughter Francesca to brain cancer at nine months old. In the year since Francesca's passing, the Kaczynskis have raised over $2 million to fund pediatric brain cancer research. You see, parents need to do this because pediatric cancer is drastically underfunded. Of the billions of federal dollars allocated to oncology research every year, only 4% is targeted to pediatric oncology. So where does that leave these kids? With incredibly stunted innovation and advancement. Every chemotherapy that Colby has been administered was developed and approved for use in adults during the time frame roughly spanning the Vietnam War, during the presidencies of Harry Truman to Jimmy Carter, the vast majority long before man walked on the moon. Is this the best we have to offer our children? We need to strive for a world where we prioritize more targeted, effective, accessible, and humane therapies for these kids. Because pediatric cancer will randomly strike one in every 285 kids before they reach adulthood. That is not rare. We never thought it would be us until it suddenly was. We are forever grateful that someday we could stand here and say that Colby is cured. But today I've shared with you the harsh reality of what cure really means in pediatric oncology. And the diagnosis is almost always a life sentence with over 90% of survivors struggling with health-related burdens later in life. And then there's kids like Shannon who make it through the years of follow-up to be considered cured and then die due to late toxicity from their treatments. And finally, 
the kids like Quinn, Emily, Kiara, Aiden, Danny, Francesca, Carlos, Tyler, Rachel, Pablo, Mia, and Carson, who will never get the chance to survive the cure. Because due to lack of effective treatment options, or oftentimes complications from their treatments, their diagnosis was a death sentence. I hope you will join us in expecting, if not demanding more from modern medicine. Anyone can make a difference by joining us in advocacy and raising awareness, donating to much needed basic research, joining the bone marrow registry, or simply donating blood to support the transfusions that these kids' lives so desperately depend on. If you're a researcher, a doctor, a healthcare professional, or anyone in the science or medical field, Colby has his own ask of you. So today, I would like everybody to do two things. Number one, make medicine so that kids with cancer don't have to die sometimes. And number two, make medicines that don't make kids with cancer sicker than they already are. I hope that kids with cancer in the future never have to go through what I've gone through. You can't change what's happened to me, but you can change the future for kids with cancer. Thank you.